without further ado, I would like to hand over then the presentation role to our colleagues in Birmingham who will present to you the practical insights from their city now. Um, Joe, I have just made you moderator. I hope you can start sharing your screen now. Yes, looking good. There we go. Can you can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Is that, is that, that better with the headphones on? It's a lot no. better, yes. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Joe Flaber. Um, I am working in the transport policy section of Birmingham City Council. And I have alongside me David Harris, who is the policy team manager. Um, I think what we're going to do this is David's going to do a bit of uh, a bit of an introduction to Birmingham uh, in general, uh, some of the background about the city, and then and then we'll uh, we'll we'll move on. I'll move on to some of the details, the technical specifics of transport space allocation uh, in due course. So first of all, I'll, I'll hand over to David. Uh, first of all. Can't hear you, David. David, sorry to interrupt. Maybe you can use the headphone as well when you present. Can you hear me okay? Coming Any better? That's much better. Okay, right. Um, so I'm just uh, setting a bit of context about Birmingham. Um, it's a, a city of 1.1 million people. Um, we're in the very sort of heart of, of England in, in the Midlands. Um, the wider metropolitan area, so the uh, little diagram on the left of your slide uh, shows where Birmingham sits in the wider West Midlands metropolitan area. Um, and that wider area has almost 3 million people in it. So the, the, the city itself is, is quite vast, but the travel to work area is, is even greater. So the transport challenges um, that we face sort of come from outside our boundary as, as well as what we have to deal with within our administrative boundary. Um, and I think it's worth just saying that um, everyone's heard of Manchester, but Birmingham is the second city um after london a bit of background really it's an industrial city um it, it really is at the heart of the industrial revolution in the 18th and 19th centuries and, and sort of built a, a, a sort of a, a very sort of firm uh, base on um a variety of different trades different industries and was once called the city of a thousand trades because of just the entrepreneurs that came to birmingham to uh, establish themselves and, and Birmingham is rich with the history of, of um, engineers and others that um, led on all the things that we take for granted in, in daily life these days. Uh, Birmingham saw a massive population explosion um, during that period so it grew from some 74,000 to over half a million in a very very short space of time and in many ways that has set some of the the problems that we now face because we have the sort of growth and expansion in the city that um, really wasn't well planned for. In the more modern history, we've then seen some of that industry dying off. Um, and um, whilst population increase, increases have gone on, we've seen um, a decline in the traditional manufacturing in the city. Um, so that the motoring industry that, that was here and others sort of then. Um, uh, that away, so we've gone through a whole process of, you know, re-diversifying our economy um, and seen the rising importance of the service sector in the city. Um, key things really that shape the modern sort of um, transport network of Birmingham um, was kind of the post-war era, um, and uh, Birmingham was quite badly damaged during World War Two, and post-war. Um, there was sort of opportunity to sort of rid the city of slums and, and um, 
uh, all the poor housing, um, and, and basically create a sort of, a, in inverted commas, modern city, um, which at that time in sort of UK policy terms was um, around the motor car and the emergence of, of you know, mass private car ownership. Um, and, and therefore, the way the city was then built was thinking about, well, um, let's have lots of motorways. And, and Birmingham itself were, had a, a, a major ring road built right around, very tightly around the city centre with a, a major sort of motorway going straight through the middle as well, which at the time seemed perfectly sensible. But now we know that that isn't really the way we want to plan or deliver our cities. So, um, what we've ended up with sport patterns and, and, and patterns of development that uh, end up with uh, overly reliant uh, use on the car. Um, just a few key facts really. So journey to work trips to Birmingham city centre, um, we, have, we have about 60% public transport mode share, which, which generally isn't too bad. Obviously we'd like to, to improve that. Um, the rest of the city, um, and Birmingham is pretty polycentric, there's some major key centres which are the size of small towns across the city um, you, you're only looking at you know a 60 percent um, a 60 percent mode share by car trips so public transport is much less used outside of trips to the city centre which is a key challenge for us uh, in terms of how do we you know target some of that mode share um, so there's you know this dispersal of employment services is clearly an issue there's um, issues around in inaccessibility and severance where we've built these kind of um, urban motorways, um, some elements of economic inequality. But as we're finding, of course, you know, the other issue is we've got pollution and environmental degradation and, and Birmingham is one of um, 28 UK cities uh, which is having to take urgent action on air quality just simply to meet the legal limits on things like nitrogen dioxide. Um, but above and beyond that, um, there's more we're going to have to do to, to really benefit from the health uh, impacts of, of cleaning up our transport network. In recent years, we've started to um, the tide um, and a number of things such as um, at the top left is the sort of regeneration of Birmingham's main transport station, which is a uh, railway station, which is the busiest railway station outside of London in the UK. Um, it serves both local and uh, UK services, so you can pretty much get to any corner of the UK um, from Birmingham New Street Station. Um, we've seen the uh, continued expansion of our, our tram network, um, which now goes to New Street and is being further extended. Um, and we've also got high-speed rail coming in the next few years, and it will link to that. So there's been a lot of positive improvements, lots of regeneration uh, in Birmingham over the last 10, 20 years. But the growth that's being um, forecast now, um, Birmingham Development Plan, which is on the left, and then our Birmingham Connected Transport Strategy, um, we're going to have to do some radical shifts in, in terms of how we deliver transport in the city. Um, and I think it's moving away from uh, where we've been focused on moving vehicles, and we've got to move people. We've got to we've got to make our transport network efficient. We haven't got space. Um, to continue to build more and more capacity. If equally we've got to fit 150,000 more people into the city, build 50,000 new homes, find space for employment and so on. So there's a challenge about you know growing a city, keeping that city sustainable, um, reducing the impacts on individuals and, and um, uh, particularly children. Um, we're a very young, we're one of the youngest cities in Europe. So, you know, how we shape, how we deliver transport has a, a is a cradle to grave impact, really. So if we get transport right and people have the right choices, you know, they, they don't become car dependent at a young age. They use walking and cycling. They're healthier. They use public transport. There's a virtuous circle that, that has spin-offs into all sorts of um, elements of, of lifestyle and how people um, uh, plan that their, their, you know they're going to work their leisure uh, and transport sits at the heart of that and I think it's been neglected uh, not just locally but in a UK context you know we've, we've planned around the car and now we're reaping the outcomes of, of those decisions really. The Family Connected Strategy which we adopted in 2014 which is our stump um, to out that case for a radical rethink really it was like we, we can't do 
what's been done. You know, it doesn't work. It's got us to here. And um, we're continuing, you know, we're going down in a vicious circle. So that was the point the city sort of said, right, we've got to stop. We've got to do things differently. Um, so we started on that journey. And, you know, anyone that's delivered or something knows that, that these things don't happen overnight. It is um, a slow and at times painful process. But but we started on that journey and, and it's now sort of taking people with us. At the heart of that, and I was saying um, it's about moving vehicles. Uh, not moving vehicles, moving people. So efficient transport networks where we can um, grow capacity uh, without having to, you know, accommodate further single occupancy car trips. You know, managing the network we got, the capacity we got in the most efficient way without having to take up more space um, for transport infrastructure unnecessarily. And then just some of the key facts. What we'd have to deal with in terms of uh, uh, car trips. So the growth that's forecast, 150,000 more people could um, generate 80,000 more cars, putting more pressure on existing road networks. Um, and, and that's 4 million trips on, on the transport network, both on public and, and by private car. And, and it's just not something that at the moment the transport network can, can accommodate. We've got to do it differently. One of the key things that we, we came up with was it's arguably quite obvious but making the case to um, politicians and others that we we're going to have to reallocate road space we're going to have to make some difficult decisions about who we prioritize in that that restricted space that we have and how do we how do we quickly articulate the benefits for different users and also make sure that as we design schemes we um, have gone through a clear process where we've thought about who needs to use that space and that that could also be a discussion about not just um, where we need to uh, accommodate movement but also where we might want to think more about uh, the function of uh, an area as a, as a place so we might use it as a, a, a lever to say actually in these areas we need to take traffic out because this is a place it's dominated by vehicles but actually we, we want it to be more about people and people to spend time here and not be, you know, sort of um, hounded out by parked cars, busy traffic and, and pollution. One of the key stats is this, this whole emphasis about moving people and not vehicles. And we've all seen the uh, the, the pictures of you know, the cars turning into you know, people sat on the road and then you put them in, into buses. And, and this kind of articulates that really. The amount of road space you could take with 19 cars, you can use that one bus or one car to take that, you know, the space of, of eight bicycles there are better ways that we can move people around the city and whilst Birmingham's big and we do have some quite uh, lengthy journeys from across the city into key centres and particularly the city centres we know that a lot of our trips um, some 250,000 journeys a day are, are less than one or two miles by car so there's a lot of scope for us to mode shift a lot of those trips to more sustainable modes. And it's finding the tools to do it and clearly um, creating different opportunities for people to travel by giving people with priority the public transport, walking and cycling on some of our roads um, is, is a key uh, change that we need to make. And I think, you know, that whole mindset about changing um, how we use parking, for example, or transport space allocation, the approach will help us set a case for making some of these changes that at the moment, um, I think both colleagues within a local authority, but also, you know, politicians and others outside would sort of um, struggle to, 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 to come to terms with. Um, just reinforcing the point about um, sort of the movement, and this shows some of the, the volumes of, of people being moved. Um, by different modes, and, and you can see that, you know, quite clearly, um, 366 cars, um, uh, 366 buses, I apologise, uh, moves, you know, so much, many more people than, than those cars. It's just a no-brainer, and when you start to present information like that, it just turns the arguments on their head, you know, you can't go on in this world where lots of people are driving around in, in cars on their own. Where did we get to? So in Birmingham Connected, we came up with a process of road space allocation that, that basically said, you know, using uh, tools like Link and Place, which is a, a approach in the UK where you 
uh, assess um, either the link, so that's the road or the place, and then you sort of grade it by different factors and you can weight it. And that starts to say to you, well, actually, in this location, you know, your focus has to be on, on the link. And, you know, one extreme, a link is, a, you know, a motorway, it has no place function. It's, it's purely about moving vehicles. The other extreme then is, you know, a very residential road. Yes, there's some movement of vehicles to get to people's houses, but actually it has a place as a community function. It's about people and it's about your sort of graded approach about how you might make different decisions within those road spaces. And whilst that took us so far and we sort of generated the link in place um, uh, grading for, for most of the city, where we were then struggling was that um, if we then wanted to make decisions in certain locations about what changes we made and how we made those, there wasn't a, a mechanism that sort of then gave us the next level of decision making. So we then started to think about network priorities and the road use hierarchy. What what do we want to do with that section? You know, it's a major radial route. Who do we want to move through there? Who gets priority? And then and then looking at of those people, of those priorities, what is the level of service we're giving them? And what what do we tolerate by level of service? So that level of service could be things like journey time between you know two points. It could be um, pedestrian comfort because of the amount of curb space you've got. Cycling infrastructure is it segregated? Um, is, is it of a standard that you know would give uh, a less confident cyclist um, the ability to to want to um, to, to cycle along? Because you know at the moment if there were no provisions, it might be uh, too scary to, to cycle along certain links. Um, for public transport, you know, can we provide dedicated bus lanes? But also within that, other road users, and there's got to be a consideration of, you know, private car users. Yes, we want to shift people out of the private car, but we've still got to keep the city moving. So it's looking at all those different users and coming up with a, a, a tool that helps us decide, you know, what level of service do we really want to achieve? What is the art of the possible? And then having an honest discussion with you know, public or politicians about saying, well, we want to move more people, therefore we need to, for example, improve public transport. That's going to mean some difficult decisions about, you know, taking away road space from private cars. But through this process, we can sort of demonstrate the winners and the losers. Um, and that allows, you know, to say up front, yes, there'll be a, a level of service reduction for private cars, but actually, there's more benefit for walking and cycling and all the other things that we want to try and achieve. And I think at a very, very high level stage, it starts bringing people along with what you're trying to do. Um, because a lot of um, politicians and highway engineers will get very, very stuck in the fact that you're taking away capacity for, for wider traffic. And I think this is a way of trying to move beyond that, that debate, really. Um, at that point, I'm going to hand over to Joe who can talk us through more of the detail of how we apply and how we develop the policy and how we start to apply it. Okay, uh, thank you, David. Um, you just said pretty much uh, most of what I wanted to say. <laughs> um, yeah, I think just picking up on a couple of things that David said there, um, for me, I think this uh, way of transport space allocation is a useful tool is in this is managing this transition away from uh, car use towards alter alternatives over time and i think one of the key challenges we have is how do we justify taking space away from motorists who are demonstrably using it at the moment to other modes who demonstrably aren't and i'm thinking particularly cyclists and the reason I mentioned cyclists is um, is because of this uh, phenomenon that we have um, in, and I don't think it's it's entirely uh, uniform to the UK by any means, but where we've got uh, people that are driving for very short distances uh, for the sort of one, two, three mile trips, um, and it's it's the point at which um, we the, the cycling is is a potential. Uh, is a potential uh, alternative mode and it's something that we don't do uh, a great deal of so i think that's that's just something I, I would mention as we as we go i think the the other point that i would make is about being careful that we don't in applying the transport space allocation policy we we seek not to build in self-fulfilling prophecies 
And I think when we're establishing levels of service for different users, one of the one of the aspects that we're grappling with at the moment is to understand that, well, what is an appropriate minimum level of service for certain users and how much stock do we place um, upon the existing function of a road? Because obviously if we if we're interpreting the function of a road through the way it's used at the moment, then we're in danger of simply replicating uh, what we've got on the ground at the minute. So in uh, developing the uh, developing the policy, uh, David's already touched on this. That the idea that we we have um, we've classified the network in terms of its link and place function at the moment. Um, we've identified network priorities across across the system, and this is quite a, a subjective judgment, uh, which is saying what what is what are what is the function of different sections of the network um, and what needs to be the what is it doing at the minute that it needs to continue to do what is it doing at the minute that it doesn't need to continue to do and what will it need to do in the future and that's like I say quite a subjective uh, judgment um, and it's also quite a, an aspirational um, way of looking at the uh, the process and out of that other well those two things drops the road user hierarchies which is a way of setting well once you've established what the network is, what the link place function is, what the network priority is, here is your policy defined road user hierarchy, i.e. here's who you prioritise most and here's who, who you prioritise uh, uh, less. Now I say less because it doesn't mean you don't prioritise them, it, it means that they are slightly lower down the uh, down the pecking order. And the, the, the thing with the transport space allocation uh, policy is that it's it's explicit that if you can fit everything in that you need to for all users, then that's what you should seek to do so. But clearly, um, and I think this is perhaps in my experience a little bit more uh, the case in UK cities, um, possibly because of the way they've developed over throughout, throughout, throughout the history, is they tend to be, even major corridors into the city can tend to be quite constrained uh, in terms of space where I think some of the uh, the continental cities that you go to um, that there seems to be uh, to me quite a lot more space available to uh, to, to accommodate different people's uh, needs. So moving on, the uh, link place function, this is just a, a, a diagram of, uh, I mean, David's already explained this, the, the um, the, the definition of uh, the, the function of a road through its link function and its place function. So I think that's fairly clear what that means. The, uh, the link function being its predominantly its movement function and place function being uh, whether or not there are, uh, whether it's a specific location that people are looking to visit and spend time in. The network priorities, as I've mentioned, have already been defined, uh, as I say, quite, quite subjectively. And as you can see, this is uh, an excerpt from the uh, from the document, which shows that the the major parts of the network um, have already been uh, defined as uh, uh, their their uses have, have been defined in terms of their network priorities. And then the levels of service uh, we're currently working through this. And I think there is a slide a bit later on that I'll spend a little bit more time on. But we we've established, as David said, um, the way that the uh, factors involved in measuring levels of service. So, for example, uh, um, the uh, motorists and uh, public transport is typically um, a measure of how uh, how close to the expected uh, normal conditions, um, free flow condition, journey time that you uh, that you're achieving. So, if it's uh, for example, uh, ninety percent of the um, expected the free flow journey time, you might uh, grade that as a, an A rating. Um, if it's sort of 60%, then that might be a, a, a C rating or, or similar. And then for, for cyclists and pedestrians, we're still working this through a little bit. Um, it's at the moment, I think some of the measures that we have are quite in depth. Um, and what we're seeking to do is to simplify a few of those measures so that it's a little bit more uh, user friendly for the designers so for example um, we've got a, got, uh, got got some um, 
measures in relation to pedestrians in terms of uh, the um, pedestrian comfort in an area and what we're seeking to do is is implement um, measures that, that would measure the simple footway width where that will be appropriate to do so and uh, less uh, sort of time consuming uh, where justified. And there is a, 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 a sort of quick run through of some of the um, uh, some of the measures that we uh, use to grade level of service. Um, yeah, um, that's uh, just just basically what I've uh, what I've run run through. And then the uh, the outcomes we, uh, we we assess each uh, um, each. We assess each scheme by a uh, different user, uh, the, uh, the, uh, whether the, the, the impact of, of each scheme. One thing that I think we do need to be um, aware of as we, as we do this is how we uh, look to allocate a level of service, a, a minimum level of service to different users. So for example, we, we set um, an aspiration for level of service for different users. But then clearly, in many cases, that um, the aspirational level of service will not be met for all users. So you might have a corridor that um, is is rated as a, a major radial for uh, major route incident for motorists, um, has been identified as a cycling priority corridor, and has been identified as um, as a public transport priority corridor, and the uh, the. The, the space just isn't available to achieve the sort of A or B rating for each of those different modes. So what this allows us to do is to uh, to provide an audit trail of what we have considered, the measures that we have, or the, the potential schemes that we have rejected, or the, or the individual measures we've rejected, um, and why we've done so, um, and how that. To, how, how that uh, is uh, communicated to uh, elected members and to the wider general public. And I think in terms of setting a minimum level of service, we, we've we've had some debate recently about how we would go about setting that. And I think one of the sort of base standards that um, I think we're we're looking at uh, looking to use is well, it's kind of where are we headed anyway? So we we need to accommodate. Um, as we said, a, a significant amount of development. All the the conditions for network users are uh, for, di for different mode users are all uniformly a uh, gradually worsening over time. In some cases, rapidly worsening. So we can articulate that that we're kind of all going there anyway. So actually, if we end up uh, making things slightly worse for motorists. In a slightly shorter time frame, in order to break this uh, vicious cycle of decline, then what we can demonstrate is that, well, yes, for motorists, we might make it slightly worse a little bit quicker than it would otherwise have done. But in doing so, we've actually managed to implement the improvements to alternative modes that mean that not only are we delivering uh, for the, the capacity to accommodate growth and to start shifting people towards using the uh, appropriate mode or, or more sustainable mode. Actually, hopefully in doing so, the level of service for motorists won't ever worsen to the point that it would have done anyway, because of course what we're doing is seeking to attract motorists out of the car to, uh, to use the alternatives. Um, and then we've uh, uh, um, uh, Points about the benefits of the policy with so the key is to, to, to ensure better decisions are made and more transparent decisions are made by considering the strategic transport objectives uh, in the use of the road network, defining the clear hierarchy for mobile priority, um, targeting efficient investment in road improvements, allocating public transport priority, encouraging cycling and walking now again. Uh, going back to cycling, um, I think cycling, particularly in this country, is quite an interesting mode. It, it, it is, in my view, it is the real missing mode. It's the, the, the mode that we, uh, whenever you see a graph of different um, different mode use uh, in the UK, 
actually our, uh, our walking rate and to some degree our public transport rate uh, are comparable to many um, sort of certainly countries on the near, uh, near continent um, say for example the, the likes of uh, the Netherlands uh, Denmark we, we're not too bad in uh, in comparison to, to countries like that but where we clearly uh, have, a, have a, a missing mode is, is in cycling mode share yeah. and of course cycling feeds into public transport use and cycling feeds into uh, people walking more and leaving the car at home so I think I think with cycling particularly where we've got these significant space constraints added to the fact that we don't have uh, a history uh, of uh, a culture uh, basis for reallocation towards cyclists I think cyclists present us with something of a challenge, but then they also present us with quite um, a, a, a sort of neat little solution in some respects. If actually we can allocate for cyclists um, along a wider wider corridors, so I don't want the policy to end up being a sort of default position that if you can't fit everything in, then cyclists are the one wants to get shifted out but there are opportunities to shift cyclists onto perhaps carry on running uh, residential routes that are themselves appropriately treated for cyclists um, whereas that wouldn't be appropriate for motorised traffic clearly because obviously you're displacing um, congestion pollution road safety issues um, and it wouldn't be appropriate for public transport because of course as soon as somebody steps off a public transport vehicle they become a pedestrian and therefore if they're 400 meters away from where they need to be they're not getting there particularly quickly whereas cyclists can so i think there's there's some creative thinking that needs to be done uh, in that respect um we'll move on and implementing the policy uh, as i say we we're currently in the process of looking at uh, several public transport improvement schemes uh, corridor schemes uh, known as sprint schemes um, in Birmingham and we are in the process of applying this guidance um, but we are it is still a work in progress so we're kind of having to feel our way through it a little bit it's not a new design guide it's not meant to be prescriptive and it does have limitations it will only get you so far but what we're working on at the moment is it becoming uh, perhaps a, a more user-friendly document that designers can pick up and doesn't prescribe to them what they need to do but equally is detailed enough that they have something to sort of hang their hat on and they can um, and they can be confident in, in policy terms that when they need to make the difficult decisions and shift space away from motorists towards alternative modes they can be confident that they can do so in a justified manner. Okay, I think that's about everything. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, David and Joe. Um, I think that was a very inspiring presentation that I'm sure we will have a lot of questions about and that's why the next big part will be an interactive session that Richard from ICLE will lead. But before we dig into that, I will once again pose a little question to our participants. And this time you will have a multiple choice question asking you what the main challenges or barriers are that you are facing in your SUMP development in your city so far. We've heard from Birmingham about one way to take decisions in difficult situations where road space is limited and where you might face a lot of uh, resistance if you take away space, for example, from the car. But of course, there can be other challenges and barriers as well. That's why we are asking you, what are the main challenges and barriers in your cities? Is it a lack of resources, finances, knowledge, skills, or personnel? Is it that the stakeholders are not defined or that you have problems to involve them, so the participation? 
Is it issues with coordination or institutional cooperation? So how you work together with other departments or how you work together with uh, institutional stakeholders? Um, is it a lack of political com commitment to agree on measures? And this might be something quite connected to the case that Birmingham put forward, that um, it can be difficult for politicians to commit or something where there's a lot of resistance or when the discussion is not fact-based anymore, when it's mainly emotional and where Birmingham presented one way, how you can try to frame the discussion in a different way to put it down again to the facts, clearly showing what will happen. Or could it be that in your city there's not enough data available that you have problems to make all these evalu evaluations or to even make these predictions. So there's a lot of potential challenges and the answers have come in. We have 71% of you who have 75%, 79%. So I think uh, most of you have chosen. So I will close the poll now and show you the results. And there is a, a wide range of different challenges. So actually all of the challenges that I just mentioned are main challenges in some of your cities. The lack of resources seems to be the biggest problem. Um, it seems to be a big constraint in 79% of your cities. Um, the stakeholders also um, discussed a lot already in the previous workshops. The stakeholders seem to be less of a problem now. Um, then there is uh, issues with coordination and that's I'm not surprised by that because that can always be difficult to, to break up the silos and to work together. A lack of political commitment is also more than half of you have problems with that. And that's, of course, a, a, a constant struggle to convince politicians. And then the last one also that there's a lack of data seems to also be a prevalent uh, problem. So thanks for your answers. We will take that with us in the next block and also in surely in the next workshop. But now that you have had some time to let the presentation sink in from Birmingham, I'm sure that you um, will have a lot of questions and that Richard has prepared an inspiring interactive session. So I will hand over the microphone to Richard now. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you on behalf of all my colleagues and myself. I'd like to say thank you very much again for attending today's webinar. Um, most of you probably know me from the first webinar we had uh, when I introduced some aspects of the program and I'm very happy to be back speaking to you today. So I would firstly like to say my local pride as a person who was born and grew up in Birmingham. I'm very happy to uh, see that my city, which I grew up in the what was once a congested city, but every time I go back, I see the vast progress that is made within the city, particularly with regards to how more people have been moved using sustainable modes of transport and as Joe and David both mentioned, the goal of the city is now to move people as opposed to cars. So um, Joe, if you would please mind turning your mic on because I thought the, the best way that we would approach this session is that if the cities that are taking part have any questions that they can actually then pose questions to yourself and Birmingham and then you can give them answers as a city who has gone through the sump process and from your experience and knowledge they can then gain some pearls of wisdom that can take them further forward than perhaps I can as a simple mobility expert and practitioner. So guys if you have any questions if you could please look into the panel on the far right hand side of your screen and enter those into the box then I will moderate a discussion using the questions that you pose, and Birmingham can, using its experience, provide us their insight into the questions that you provide. So I would, I will firstly, before some of you can please pose some questions, I would firstly uh, kick off with one of my own. 
So, um, Joe, how how exactly did how have you how did you go about convincing politicians? Obviously, you have the fact based argument, but what level of resistance did you find that there was was based simply upon the notion that cars are the way that cars are the way that things work that was it a matter of tradition or was it just people were not convinced by sustainable modes as well no i i, I think there is um an emerging um certainly much more of an acceptance that we can't carry on doing things as we've been doing them i think there is a tendency and i wouldn't say this is the case of Birmingham specifically, but I think there is a, a case in the UK that we have tended um, to kind of muddle through um, and uh, things just about work. And it's I, maybe that's a cultural thing, I don't know, but we kind of just about get by. But now we are at the point where I think over the past 20 or so years, I mean, you saw some of the slides with uh, some of the developments that have gone on in Birmingham. Uh, over that period of time. I don't think this is a new phenomenon. I think we clearly have been investing in uh, uh, different transportation systems. You see the investment in uh, New Street Station, you see, see uh, the investment in the commitment to high speed too. Um, and the, the sort of the, the money that has uh, come back into cities in general uh, in terms of office development, uh, new residential development and regeneration within the city as a whole. And I think now people are understanding that that, that needs to be serviced, that people's movement needs uh, need, need to be serviced appropriately. Um, and now we've got the, the levels of growth uh, forecast that we, we have. I think that, that only adds to it. So I don't think there is a particular resistance to, uh, to change. It's just how about how we go about uh, managing that transition um, from uh, sort of the, the, a, a car dominated system uh, to more sustainable modes and how we do that in a, a reasonable and justified, uh, justified way. So uh, I don't know if that sort of um, answers your question or if you want me to, to expand a bit more. But well, I think that's a very good. I think that's a very good point in terms of that you need to make it a gradual approach because if you try and do too much at once, then that can lead to resistance. But obviously, there is, shall we say, there's sometimes just a lack of understanding amongst stakeholders or politicians. And then, so in order to bring or to engender that understanding, you need to involve them in the process. So to what extent when Birmingham, during the drafting and creation of Birmingham Connected and also in the upcoming public consultation of the um, road space allocation policy, what measures and ways have you or will you be involving the public? Uh, is, it, is it in a smaller level on focus groups or is it more public meetings or surveys? What are the methods that Birmingham is using, please? to try and get citizens involved in the transport develop policy development process. Okay, I'll hand, uh, hand over to David to answer this one. Hi, oh, yeah. um, we'll just be very naked, um, we need quite a broad range of um, engagement. So, um, you can see my, my sharing of information on uh, what we call the green paper at the time. Sorry, we can't hear you very well. Could you maybe the microphone a bit closer. Is, it, is that better? Yes. Okay. Um, so we did a, a citywide consultation on what we called a green paper. So that was sort of issues and options. It set out the evidence base, what we considered to be the key problems. You know, we looked at you know the population growth, demographics, transport statistics, and information, and, and set out a picture of the challenges facing Birmingham. And then again, that set out a range of options. So. Some of the slides we showed earlier was saying, well, you know, we're going to have 80,000 more cars. That's going to put 4 million daily trips on the transport network. And it's then sort of saying, well, in a do nothing scenario, what does that look like? And, and then sort of gradually saying, well, we could do this. We could do. And some of the ideas that were in the initial green paper were quite radical. 
Um, and clearly people are, are more averse to, to the extremely radical options. But equally, you know, there, there, there's that kind of, you know, using the consultation to, to find the, the middle ground where people are comfortable. And I think, you know, there was a, a consensus that there was a, a change in the way transport is, is provided and delivered in the city. Um, and, and, and how we deliver that, and I think Richard's point about, you know, some of it can't be sharp, sharp short shock. Um, I think absolutely you're right. I think where we are in Birmingham at the moment is um, we're in an unprecedented situation where um, we're about to see levels of development and growth in the city over the next 10 years that I don't think any of us that are working here now have ever seen in our lifetime. And that's going to require um, some really um, different thinking about how we deal with that at the moment. Um, and, and that's not just at the officer level. I think it's then the politicians that are kind of grappling with that as well. We've got so much development happening in Birmingham city centre. Um, there's growth in terms of the jobs and the housing. Um, but, you know, we're building massive infrastructure projects like the high speed two rail line. And we've got large parts of the city being completely regenerated. Um, and that's going to put pressure on the transport network. Um, we've got to put a clean air zone in in the next couple of years. And, and so whilst we've been kind of using the, the, the principles of Over Connected to do that sort of um, teasing it slowly and, and, and turning direction, actually now we're kind of thinking uh, we've got an opportunity. We're going to have to do some of the radical stuff very, very quickly. Otherwise, the transport network isn't actually going to um, to, to be able to cope um, with with the level of, of pressure and, and and demand on on the network. So um, that's just an interesting part. I think there can be opportunities where you can implement quite radical shift because you know you, you can show that unless we do something very very differently, then the city won't deliver on its you know its wider objective for um, regeneration, economic growth. Um, and, and managing that change sustainably, really. Um, just getting back to the consultation, so we did a number of things. Um, we we did a sort of online consultation, questionnaires. Um, we did a number of focus uh, sessions around the city, a drop-in so people could come talk to um, officers and discuss what was in, in the document and proposals. Um, we did uh, a number of sort of um, big events at um, so the town hall in Birmingham, where the leader of the council presented um, to key stakeholders about you know what the council's vision and priorities were for transport and why we had to do something differently. Um, and we did sort of focus groups with sort of um, uh, stratified, you know, stratified kind of um, targeted uh, people from different walks of life, different communities. Um, to, to really try and get a representative view of, of people's opinions of transport. So, you know, there was a lot of work done, um, which then formed um, sort of the, the discussion around the green paper, and that was then turned into the Birmingham Connected White Paper, which is, is now our transport strategy. So it, a lot of work and a lot of consultation went on, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, thanks very much for the insight. So as you see, it was, so we all hear that it's a very rigorous process essentially so there was that clear citizens consultation but we've had uh, a question from martin berlin which was so he uh, he wonders what the politicians biggest concern was or has been and so that how have they expressed their opposition or concerns to Birmingham's future transport plans and indeed wider ur urban development future. How have the politicians? What, what has their biggest? What has their biggest concern been? Um, I think the biggest concern that, that we've um, seen really is is the shift of you know we, we we might make things worse or we're going to make things worse for private car drivers. Because I think whilst there's a lot of paying lip service to doing that, actually when push comes to shove, when you actually have to make those those calls, that's difficult for politicians because it's not it's not favourable. And it, even even when we set out things like race based allocation, which tries to demonstrate why over the long term we are making things better, I think they still struggle with it. 
but I think that will continue to, to, to be the issue. Um, it, it takes someone very, very bold and very, very robust to um, be quite anti-car, particularly in a city like Birmingham. And, um, and I think that's one of the biggest struggles. I think from a, from a development point of view, um, I, I just think it's it, it's making sure that our transport decisions or how we decide, so, so one of the key issues is how do we fund transport? Um, so there's lots of things in Bowen Connected and also in the wider West Midlands strategic transport plan that um, are, are unfunded. There, there are major infrastructure uh, changes we want to make, but we can't fund them. So. You know, within the UK, looking at different models of, of, of funding um, transport infrastructure um, are, are being cooked up. And, and some cities have been successful taking forward things like congestion charging um, or workplace parking levels, for example, Nottingham. Um, but in a lot of cities outside London, it, it's very sort of standard um, kind of approaches. In Birmingham, we've been lucky we've got an enterprise zone. Some of our um, New infrastructure, metro extensions are, are being sort of built on the back of the enterprise only uplift in business to generate, um, and also through the HS2 connectivity package that was negotiated with government, we've we've got you know a vast sum of, of investment to, to support insurance. But still, there are a lot of uh, projects that we want to deliver that we can't fund. So it's there's also that kind of decision: we want the growth, we want you know to develop. Sustainably, but how do we do that? And if we want to improve our transport infrastructure, we need to think about different ways of funding it. So, you know, we, we do need to invest in those controversial things, be it workplace parking levies, uh, but things like capital and value capture um, as well. Um, but there is a, uh, there's always a difficulty because you could be um, just that could be seen to be detrimental. Could you adjust your microphone a bit? It's a Sorry. bit difficult to hear again. <laughs> A bit. Is that, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll talk. I'll talk as loud as I can. So, I mean, those are the key issues, really. Sorry, uh, David. Could you very quickly just uh, do a very short summary of that in case people missed the last yes, thirty seconds? Or so? Um. In, in summary, I think the key issues really are um, being perceived to be anti-car, um, and. A lot of the measures we we're promoting through the likes of Home Connected are based on you know trying to uh, encourage, whether that be with a carrot or a stick, people to not use their cars so much. And then um, I think the other issue is um, is around uh, how we fund transport, and, and that may also lead to um, uh, decisions around things that are not popular. Would be that uh, workplace parking or or charges to developers. Okay, fantastic. So there are some good, but that gives you an example of even though Birmingham has successfully developed its sump and is now moving forward with the process, it shows that it doesn't come easily to anyone, regardless of, and Birmingham has a lot of political support seemingly behind the process. So it's something that all of us or all of you will encounter in your local authorities when developing your sumps. So in terms of now that we've spoken about the political process and the getting stakeholders on board um i would like to i was just wondering david and joe so for other cities for the other cities that are here how have you worked together because obviously as we know sump is an integrated planning approach that implies that you work together with other departments other field other policy fields other topical areas what has your cooperation with other departments within Birmingham City Council looked like, which I believe is the largest in Europe? And how have you gone about linking your work with that of other areas? Have certain structures worked? What have the challenges been? And how have you been able to facilitate effective collaboration and cooperation with other departments? OK, I think um, the, the first um, key point to make is that the Birmingham Connected um, Transport Strategy um, was uh, sort of based upon and, and, and relates directly to um, the city's um, land use development plan, um, and which at the highest level sets out 
the, the sort of the growth that we forecast in the city. So the current development plan has a planning horizon of 2031. Um, and, and, and it's kind of making sure that the, the land use and uh, transport planning is aligned as far as possible because clearly, you know, um, some of those big infrastructure changes are going to be focused on not just the city centre, but where you've got major growth and regeneration projects happening across the city. Um, for example, um, to the north uh, east of, of Birmingham, we've got a major uh, regeneration site in the Greenbelt. It's controversial um, because using Greenbelt land is, is, is you know, uh, seen as uh, almost like a measure of last resort. Um, but in, in terms of what we need to do in terms of providing employment, sites and housing, we've Could had you, to uh, use... Oh, sorry, uh, one second, Joe. Could you please just clarify uh, what Greenbelt land sorry. is and people don't know? Say again, do I need to clarify? Could you please just clarify what Greenbelt quickly clarify what Greenbelt land is in case you okay, so, want to term? So Greenbelt land is um, really just uh, areas of... Um, land around major urban areas to stop uh, sort of encroachment of urban areas to stop them joining up really um so in planning policy terms it is protected and there are a lot more stringent planning conditions and, and uh, policies um to stop development in those areas um on the basis that we don't want you know massive uh, urban areas just all start to join up um and in the uk it has been a a key policy around areas like London and major cities like Birmingham to stop further urban urban growth into uh, into the surrounding countryside. Um, so I think it's that coordination between the planning and uh, transport, the land use planning and the transport, which has been critical. I think you know Birmingham Connected is is mapped back onto that growth and where we need to focus uh, the, the, the transport investment around where we're targeting the growth and regeneration. In terms of, um, of delivery and making that work, so obviously transport policies is one element of the transport department, um, but I think I alluded to, to it earlier, it's always taking other parts of, of, of the council with you, um, and I think working with some of our engineering colleagues and infrastructure projects teams is, is quite difficult because you're getting them to think about delivering things in a different way. And it's one thing to have um, the policies and the guidance, but you've got to take them on a journey with you because, you know, people historically, you know, worked on projects and it's, this, is, this, is, this is what a civil engineer does, this is how we deliver things. Um, and actually you've got to get them to approach and come to a scheme with a different mindset. And I think as we've moved on, that has become challenging because where we developed policy and and then sort of we've been hands off in terms of delivery, things have then happened and, and then the question has come back as well, why have we delivered it this like this? And it's kind of, you know, as we've gone through learning that we've got to make sure that everyone is on that journey and I think that is really a key issue. It's changing, but it, that, that's been a difficulty. And I, it, it is then, you know, there are so many, you know, transport bleeds into so many other things. And within the council, there are different elements of a local authority that have an influence on transport. And I uh, think, you know, in the UK, and it's probably the same for uh, European colleagues, the dual journey creates so much transport and working with other departments to, to look at how we might change how, you know, schools deal with transport and, and children get into school is, is another key challenge for us. Um, I could go on, there, there are lots of others, procurement, you know, how we, um, you know, procure uh, services and vehicles and particularly with the air quality agenda, making sure that those departments think about types of vehicles that are being procured and, you know, other are right emissions and those sorts of things. So there's all sorts of challenges across lots of areas. Um, and I think for anyone starting off on their summer journey, it all becomes very, very overwhelming very, very quickly because there's so many things that you need to do. And I think that then you need to manage expectations because you can't do all this overnight. Um, it, it is at times like turning an oil tanker, oil tanker in concrete, not even tree in concrete. It, it can be that difficult, but um, over time it, it does get easier. Well, it seems to be anyway. There we, well, uh, there we go. So 
positive news for everyone here. It does actually get easier, despite any of the opposition <laughs> you might face. Eventually. Eventually. That, that, that was needlessly <laughs> negative. Thank you. So, um, <laughs> so if any of you have questions, uh, whilst we have Birmingham here, I would please urge you to just put them into the chat. Um, we still have a few minutes left, so we can definitely get a couple more questions in. So uh, just kind of slightly from an interested local boy who grew up in the area, just while we wait for a few more questions, uh, could you please, how do you think, on a more personal note, how do you think the city will have changed in 10 years time? Do you think the quality of life will be, have been achieved that you hope will be brought about by the transport measures? Or will at some point expectations have to be reduced? And will you be satisfied if you don't achieve everything that you have set out in the plan, in Birmingham Connected and in the Birmingham Development Plan? Hello? Uh, sorry, uh, could you please uh, just start that again? Uh, I, we didn't catch the first. Uh, yeah, that's a better joke. Could you, yeah, okay, if you go, please? I think we're on a really positive journey already. Oh, no. Sorry, Joe. Uh, sorry, Joe, you've dropped out again. Could you maybe try and use David's microphone, perhaps? Yep. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Um, we were, um, I think we're already on a... Oh, no. Sorry. Um, yeah, it's getting difficult again. Um, sorry. Um, there we go. Is that better? That's perfect. Okay. Keep it there. <laughs> um, I, I think we're on a really positive journey. We've got, you know, um, probably the highest quality of life of any English city outside of London. Um, and uh, I think with, with a lot of the investment that's happening, um, we, will, we will continue on that journey. Um, in terms of the second part of your question, um, do, was it, do, I, do I think that um, we will deliver all the transport measures in, in 10 years? Is that... do, you, do, you, do you think that that's realistic? Um, I think given the programme we've got, and, and some of the key things that we're going to deliver, so the HSP connectivity program, which will see our bus rapid transit network um, started, uh, the metro extensions um, through to the HS2 station out to the, the east of the city. Absolutely, I, I think, you know, the, the rail improvements we're going to have as well, they will get delivered. Uh, I think there are questions around whether some of the, the, the other things that we've started to look at can be delivered. It, as I said earlier, it very much depends on, on the funding. but. I think even if we can deliver what we've got committed through things like the HS2 connectivity package, um, we will see a step change. Um, and I think if we can do some of the things around um, race-based allocation and, and, and make those noises about, you know, actually, we're not a car city anymore. We, we are a, a city about, you know, good public transport. We want to be a world-class city uh, for, 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 you know, for for public transport and good connectivity, I, I think we'll be much of the way there. It, it, it's as much about mindset and people's perception of the city as it is about just delivering the infrastructure. Um, I think we already have a reasonable public transport network in Birmingham. I just think it, it's 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 about shifting the perception of that as well and, and making people think about how they travel differently. And that's a that's a really difficult really difficult task for any city really. Sorry, there we go, I had to unmute myself. Um, just to, so you're talking about, so something to put out to both both of yourselves, just as we come slowly towards the close. So both to those of you uh, participants in the audience, please, uh, Lasse, just put some questions in the chat. If you could please just have a look and uh, maybe have a think about what sort of, how a level of service might impact defining those levels of services that you offer to you, the various types of transport users that you have in your city, how that might impact on the SUMP that you're developing. And to put that question back to Birmingham, whilst our participants consider what different levels of service they will develop, you mentioned very briefly about the baselines. 
for the level of service. Um, have they been clearly defined for each mode so far? Will they be qualitative or quantitative? And what sort of area will they cover? Will it be we have kind of a pilot area in which you try, in which you measure these different levels of service? Or will it be the whole of the city? Good question. And this is... Sorry, uh, could you please, oh, sorry, could you please just bring the mic a bit nearer, David? Joe, is that, is that any better? Yeah, that's good. Thanks. Oh, no. Sorry, no, that's gone. If, uh, it worked really well with the last question. If you could try and do it the same way again, that would be great. Pretty much exactly where, uh, where David was. So. Uh, yeah, no, but that's well, good now. That's good now. Yeah, yeah, I, think, I think it's the uh, connection between the laptop and the uh, wireless, to be honest. Um, yeah, I, I, I think the, the in terms of level of setting, I think it's a bit of a work in progress at the moment. Um, and I think... We're currently working through, as I say, uh, some public transport corridor schemes um, that, uh, that that we're looking uh, to develop it as we go uh, to. And you said about setting the setting the standards. I think we what we're investigating at the minute is whether or not we set um, minimum standards on the basis of the combined link place uh, uh, existing link place uh, valuation, if you like, um, and the identified network priorities. What we're essentially saying here is uh, an objective place by place and saying, well, this is the level of service that it is at the moment. What we'll do is essentially allow it to fall by one grading point or, or whatever that might be. I think the, the danger of that is that we could fall into um, the building self. Oops, sorry. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, the mic's dropping in and out. Um, if you could please try and move a bit quicker, uh, sorry, move a bit closer, and then as the clock strikes 12, it might also be time to slowly wrap up. Okay. Um, so yeah, sorry about the mic. mic That's fine. Sound it? quality is great. If you could please just yeah, just summarise what you said, that'd be great. Yeah, but basically, I'll say is it's a work in progress in terms of uh, level of service. Um, I think what we probably what we're doing at the moment is investigating whether or not we set uh, an objectively set uh, minimum level uh, for each user, i.e., one that's uh, preordained, if you like. Um, rather than going from place to place and seeking to, to set, set a minimum on the basis of what's there already. Because I think what we've got to avoid is delivering self-fulfilling prophecies. Um, and the, the danger, I think, is that where transport space education policy where it might fall down if we're not able to say, well, actually, a link place valuation of 3C or whatever whatever we've uh, set it as, and here are the network priorities. That means that the minimum level of service for motorists, whatever it is at the moment, is grade C or grade D or whatever it might be, so that we have room to manoeuvre. Because if we don't do that, then I think the temptation will always be uh, that, that it will um, that, that we'll allow it to fall a bit, but we may not be able to deliver some of the more ambitious um, sustainable transport measures. And just quickly, David, in relation to the last question, I think one of the key, uh, the key challenges is, to, is not simply to deliver for different users, is to deliver the right type of infrastructure for different users. And there needs to be an understanding of who are you designing for? Who do you need to um, who do you need to be catering for? Who do you need to attract onto these networks? So, for example, I've mentioned about cycling earlier on, uh, pedestrians and cyclists. I, I think the, the big ticket items, if you like, the the, the public transport, the metro, the sprint, um, the rail, will, will be delivered. I think 
where we need to be mind, mindful of it is the need to deliver very safe networks for uh, pedestrians and cyclists, by which I'm thinking particularly about children uh, and uh, the elderly and mobility impaired. And if we can do that, I think we'll um, we can we can achieve a lot. Fantastic. Uh, thanks for that great answer, Joe. And so something that he clearly reflected in his answer there is the need to you need to understand the need you need to understand who you're delivering your transport service for, what their needs are, and then make the infrastructure fit according to what they require, as opposed to what you think the a trans, transport within an urban area should look like. And importantly, um, it needs transport needs to be safe and inclusive as well. So thank you very much for the fantastic discussion and the questions I received as well, and Birmingham as well for the great answers. Um, I think we've all certainly learned a lot today from the experience that Birmingham's brought with them. And it's something that we can all take forward and implement and integrate into the development of SUMPs within our own areas. So thank you very much, guys. Um, I will now hand back to Anna, who will wrap up the rest of the webinar. Thank you.